All right, everyone, so we'll go ahead and get started on the second part of Chapter 8, Pathophysiology. Uh, this section is a little bit more like immune stuff, like immunology, and uh, like stress response, stuff like that. So uh, we just talked about mods in the previous chapter, um, but let's, you know, it kind of relates to the immune system. But the immune system, you know, it protects the body from foreign invaders, right? Foreign substances, uh, you know, so that could be allergens, right? Like pollen or tree nuts. It could also be, um, you know, HIV or, you know, Staph aureus or MRSA or whatever. So, it, you know, it protects the body from foreign stuff. Um, and so, you know, there's, they want you to know there's anatomical barriers, decrease the chance of foreign substance invading the body. Like, who, who knew? If you have intact skin, you know, you don't end up with infection. Like, wow. Um, so, yeah, you know, the, the you know, the, the value in that is if someone has like a big lack to their arm or a dog bite or a snake bite or a burn, you know, if the skin gets compromised in some way, um, even a needle, right? Like you, you greatly increase your chance of some type of uh, foreign invasion. Okay. Whether it's a virus like hepatitis C or, you know, HIV or staph aureus or whatever, you know, like you increase the risk of uh, infection. So, we uh, they divide the immune system in two sections, right? There's something called natural immunity and acquired immunity, um, and we'll we'll talk about that. So uh, you know, uh, acquire. So if you acquire something, what are you doing, right? You're like gathering it, right? Something you're getting. So you acquire immunity through going through your life. You know, you could get acquired immunity from vaccines. Would be an example. Uh, natural immunity. This is uh, well, you know, your skin could be part of that. But, you know, you're born with these things called natural killer cells, which I think is freaking cool. Like, what a cool name to have. Um, natural killer cells, uh, NK cells, they end up going and they just uh, – they'll, they'll kill stuff kind of indiscriminately, but they're not trained or taught. You're just kind of born with them. It's not enough for your body to, 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 to fight with just natural killer cells, but they're a good part of our immune system. They're some of the first responders to the scene. Um, and then uh, what's an immunogen? So – this is uh, an antigen capable of generating an immune response. So what's an antigen though? Like what is that? Antigens are viruses, bacteria, funguses, tree nuts. Again, you know, like I'm allergic to tree nuts. Um, so stuff like that. You know, antigens are something, it's a bad something that's capable of telling the immune system, let's fight, buddy. So this is kind of uh, worth knowing what an immunogen is. It's an antigen, which is still a bad thing, um, that's capable of generating an immune response. Okay, so let's talk about this. They they break it down on this table, and you know I know these tables are in your book, so sometimes it's va some value I could add if I just explain to you what the hell's going on here, right? So, um, uh, when we have an antigen, let's use the example of Staph aureus. Okay, Staph. Okay, uh, it's a bacteria. So. What happens is um, we have this antigen and it'll form with antibodies. So it's way ahead. This is an antibody and <clears throat> this is an antigen. So let's imagine that this is our Staph aureus and um, you might have these antibodies floating around in your uh, blood. And so if <clears> – <throat> sorry, you have antibodies that – perfectly match up with whatever the antigen is, in my case it's tree nuts, um, then you can have this agglutination of uh, antibodies and antigens linking up with each other. So here's what I'm going to draw for you. When we have antigens that will bind up with an antibody, antibodies are kind of uh, our immune system, okay? Uh, these are the things that float around in our blood looking for that specific something that will bind to the receptors. And so what happens is uh, there's several ways that we can fight off infection or uh, some type of foreign invader. So first off, I want to point out, I got to be clear, antigen has to bind with antibody to create an antigen antibody complex, right? So they're bound together at this point. And this really kicks off the immune system when they get bound together. And one of the ways we can fight this is through complement activation. And what complement activation does is it creates pores um, in the actual bacteria itself. So it's like 
literally will drill holes into the cellular membrane of this bacteria. And so when that happens, as you can imagine, the cell kind of blows up and disintegrates. So that's one way we can fight off is through complement activation, okay? And this will eventually lead to a hole right here and then that'll cause the cell to burst, okay? Um, another way through complement activation is we can uh, activate complement and this creates something called opsonization, right? Opsonization means to set the table, literally. And so what happens is we can um, set the table for phagocytosis. So these little phagocytes, these little Pac-Man guys are hungry. So we just set the table and we kind of like mark them with a laser, like with your rifle. And you're marking it with a, your target with a laser. And so it tells the phagocytes to come in and come eat this antigen antibody complex. Another way complement works is that um, it will tell the cells to release histamine and other immune mediators um, from the white blood cells. And so this will increase our inflammatory response, okay? So complement has this really important role and uh, uh, immune response. So I'll recapitulate. Complement, first it creates immune, uh, uh, it, it creates a uh, uh, membrane, the membrane attack complex map, right? Where it'll kind of drill holes into the membrane cause the cell to burst. If that's not enough, it'll also try to opsonization for phagocytosis. So it kind of sets the table for phagocytosis. It marks it with a laser and says, hey, this one, eat it. And then it also will release immune mediators like histamine, which will increase inflammatory response. Okay. Now, also agglutination. So cells bound with antigens will clump and agglutinate. So agglutination is like literally um, these antigen antibody complexes will, will like clump up. It looks like like jello, like they like they actually clump up with each other. And so that also says to the phagocytes, oh wow, we have agglutination over here. You should go. That, that's like a big meal. You should go eat it. So they will go over there and start chomping on uh, this uh, agglutination that's taking place. Okay. Um, another way the antigen antibody complex will work is um, through precipitation. So um, uh, these these antigens can precipitate onto um, each other, and or I'm sorry, the antibodies can precipitate onto each other, and um, uh, this will also lead to phagocytosis. You know, Pac-Man guys. Okay, and then that lastly, um, we don't see this very often. It doesn't happen though. Is neutralization. So antibodies can actually just bind to a bacterial toxin and virus, and it just neutralizes them. So um, you will still have the bacteria in your blood per se, but you're going to have these uh, antibodies that will bind to the toxins that are produced, and then it will uh, make it kind of ineffective. So an example of this is like uh, like to toxoid virus or uh, uh, not toxoid uh, toxoid vaccines like uh, uh, measles, mumps, rubella, or no, I'm Jesus, Tdap. I'm sorry, uh, like tetanus, diphtheria, um, pertussis. Right, so it all uh, all of these viruses produce toxins, and so we, since we've been vaccinated for Tdap, um, we'll we'll go in there and we will uh, have antibodies that, as soon as they see that little tetanus toxin, they'll go in there and grab onto it and deactivate it. So it makes it to where it can't be used. So uh, that's that's kind of some general immunology stuff, and I hope that kind of clears it up for for you. Now we have this thing called humoral immunity, and when you hear humoral immunity, I want you to think antibodies. I'll say that again. Humoral immunity equals antibodies. Okay. What are antibodies? Again, it's these things. It's these things that'll go in there and they kind of grab onto antigens and either mark them for phagocytosis or they'll neutralize toxins or whatever it is that they do. Um, but there's several different ways they'll work. So again, humoral immunity is like we get humoral immunity through vaccination um, is a big part of humoral immunity. Um, and so that is antibodies. Okay. And uh, those are called immunoglobins. So B cells, which are um, B cells, produce um, antibodies. And so uh, they, the other word for this was, is they'll call them immunoglobins, immunoglobulins. Okay. We have cell mediated immunity. So this is where T cells will go in there and just straight up like attack stuff like foreign antigens. So this is where you will have a, a cell go in there, like a like a T cell just go and straight up fight um, without antibodies. They don't have to have antibodies. Um, subgroup subgroups of T lymphocytes destroy foreign material. So here's what this looks like. Um, again, this is in your book, so let's just talk about it. 
So these little blue dots are antigens, right? Something bad, whatever it is. Poison ivy, tree nuts, HIV, whatever. Something bad. And so what happens is um, you get exposed to this antigen. However that happens, doesn't matter. And sometimes we can have um, this antigen will bind to B cells. And so when it binds to these B cells, it says, hmm, I don't recognize you, but you probably are a bad dude. So I'm going to build up my army to fight you. And I may not kill you this next time, this time, but next time I'm going to whoop you. So here's what happens is it'll bind to this antigen and then um, it'll start programming these B cells to say, oh, for the next time we want to be ready. So you'll end up producing these um, antibody B cells. And so what's going to happen now is you're going to start producing specific antibodies to this antigen. Okay. Um, and that's what they're showing you here. B cells produce antibodies. And when they produce antibodies, they can neutralize or in many different ways fight antigens, which I've described on previous slides. But we can also have memory B cells. So memory B cells, part of humoral immunity, um, what happens is these guys don't forget. So what will happen is next time, let's say you are immunized for uh, diphtheria or pertussis, okay, whooping cough. And um, the next time that you are exposed to pertussis, since you've been immunized, your body will immediately say, oh, I recognize this. This is pertussis. It's bad. I happen to have antibodies to fight this. Let's send them. So it will immediately be able to not go through these steps. It just goes straight from here and immediately starts producing um, antibodies. So that's, an, that's, a, that's a helpful way that our body fights. And the reason that I'm telling you humoral immunity is a big part of immunization because it's occasionally tested that way. Uh, so humoral immunity equals antibodies. And they go out <clears throat> and they're secreted by B cells and they fight um, antigens, okay, in a variety of different ways. Now, um, this is a different response that we'll see. This is uh, like a T, like a, I'll just show you. So basically, sometimes when we get an antigen, it'll interact with this macrophage guy and it'll chew it up. Well, the macrophage will say, I'm only going to half ass chew you and I'm going to show you to my friends. And so it'll show you. To, it'll show the antigen to the B lymphocytes to where it can say, produce your uh, 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 antibodies, and I want you to not forget this one. What can also happen is it can half-ass chew this antigen, and it can produce T lymphocytes. And T lymphocytes are the cell-mediated response, right? So this is the ones that just straight in there and just go attack. They don't use, they don't like produce antibodies and stuff like that. They just go out there and fight. So this is your activated T lymphocyte cell-mediated immunity. Okay, and so basically, um, the idea is when macrophages bite on this antigen is two things. We immediately need to fight through humoral and T-cell mediated response, but let's also create memory cells. So if we ever see this cockroach again, we can kill them really, really quickly. And that's kind of the idea of the immune system, okay? Uh, uh, memory becomes really important. Memory becomes really important for these cells to remember these and have... Uh, uh, immunity. And again, I keep telling you, this is how vaccines work. Okay. This is what I was showing to you. These are specific antigens. This is IgG into antigen. Uh, it, it does look like this. And so the idea is like, uh, or I'm sorry, these are IgG antibodies. And so when it binds to a specific antigen, see how like this step would just perfectly fit in here. It kind of activates it and says, okay, I, I'm an antibody that has bound to an antigen. Let's do it. Let's fight. So it kind of calls in all its friends and other immune cells, and, and that's how that happens. I just want to point out, this is IgG, okay? Uh, this is from chronic stuff, and then IgM, it's the first responder, right? So this is, you see IgM in acute re uh, response, and just, there's different shapes, okay, of antibodies. You don't need to know why they're different shapes and how they're different shapes and why, you know, and you don't need to know about light chain and heavy chain and all that. That's garbage um, for EMT school. So just know these are antibodies, okay? Um, so the inflammatory response, um, we've talked about this. It's response to the body's, you know, uh, response to irritation or injury. Um, inflammatory response and immune responses are independent processes. So remember, inflammatory response, a slap to the cheek, doesn't necessarily bring immune response. Okay, they're independent, 
but they do coexist. They do sometimes work together. But just because one is activated doesn't mean the other one is always activated. They, they are independent. Okay. And acute inflammation response involves vascular and cellular components. Polymorph polymorphonuclear neutrophils. Neutrophils are white blood cells that are first responders. Um, you see this in pus, right? So in like acne and stuff, those are neutrophils almost always. Uh, arrive at the site of tissue injury. And so what they'll do is they're initially inside the vessels, so intravascular, but they have to extract uh, uh, diapedesis, right? They have to like be able to escape out into, you know, the space that they need to go fight in. So they will get out of the vasculature and into the third spacing or wherever the injury is at. And so that they go into the intra extravascular phase, your uh, uh, space, okay? Um, you don't need to know these. This is crazy. They want you to know this. Um, but margination, activation, adhesion, transmigration, and chemotaxis, these are the steps in the sequence that, that – just take my word. This is the step that neutrophils have to go through to get in the vessel, out of the vessel, so they can go fight. Okay? Now, they do produce cytokines, interleukins, interferon, and lymphokines. Uh, you don't need to know what each of these do. Just know that they're involved in immune response to call in all their other buddies uh, and come fight. You know, what's rule number one of a gunfight, right? A, bring your biggest, baddest gun. Rule number two is bring all your friends with guns. So that's what's happening with neutrophils, right? They're bringing all their other friends with guns, and that's what these are doing. They're trying to call in all their friends to come fight. Um, all right, so inflammatory response. Um, uh, so this is talking about wound healing. Um, there, there's several ways that this – there's steps of this happening. This is like a very uh, brief explanation of it. But basically uh, – Let's say you have like a, a cut, you know, on your cheek. You have to repair the damaged tissue, one. First, you have to stop the bleeding, right? And then start repairing damaged tissue. And then you have uh, – so you'll end up with swelling and stuff around your cheek, or your cheek, and there's inflammatory products there. And then so you have to start – after inflammation has taken place and it's, you know, started repairing the damaged tissue, you have to clear the inflammatory uh, debris. And then you have to restore the tissue to a normal state. Okay, and then you'll start regenerating uh, cells. Okay, it's a process, you know. Uh, I will point out wound healing doesn't always take place, it does not take place in the heart. You cannot uh, uh, really heal uh, like brain tissue and heart tissue, it doesn't regenerate. Nerve, t uh, neural tissue, it doesn't regenerate. So, just be aware wound, wound healing is kind of like skin, you know, it's a good example. It's good, we've seen wound healing on our skin, is what I'm saying. So, there's different factors that can lead to dysfunctional wound healing, you know. You know, uh, poor nutrition, uh, certain diseases, which we don't need to cover. Okay, cool. Here we go. So let's say we have t tissue injury. So it's going to ca cause a release of uh, histamine, complement maybe get activated, prostaglandins, other chemical mediators. And so we're going to draw neutrophils to the site. We're going to increase the capillary permeability. We're going to increase the dilation of the, per of the capillaries. And we talked about when this happens, we get redness and heat. Okay, but when we increase the permeability, we end up with increased plasma, oxygen, clotting factors to that area because they get released be because the capillaries are now permeable. And so when we have increased clotting factors, we get blood clotting. When we have increased nutrients, we get healing. When we have increased uh, plasma into the area, we get pain and swelling. And the swelling will temporarily reduce uh, movement. That's called functional lessa, right? It's, it's a Latin term. Um, and then so this is all pretty intuitive, right? But also when we have tissue injuries, you know, we'll get white blood cells that will migrate to the injured area. They'll uh, stick to the capillary walls. They'll pass through the capillary walls. They will go phagocytize or eat the bacteria or dead tissue products, including your own cells that have been necrotic and blown up, right? Pus may form. Pus is white blood cells and cellular debris. Um, and then the debris will be moved from the white blood cells. So this is that whole stuff that I just described on the other slide, but this is kind of like a, a visual representation of that. Okay. And then that's uh, it for that, but we're going to move into a uh, uh, immune response, excuse me. Immune response. Um, so there's four types of hypersensitivity reactions. Um, so, um, I wouldn't spend a whole lot of time memorizing these, but just know they exist for now. Um, hypersensitivity, I want you to think immune response, uh, like an allergic reaction of sorts. You know, that certainly happens here. Uh, so a type 1 
immediate hypersensitivity reaction, this is anaphylaxis, okay? So this is a food uh, allergy, like for me it's tree nuts, maybe, you know, peanut butter or whatever for other people. It may be a bee sting, an, an, an a re allergic reaction to penicillin. This is immediate response to a food. It happens very quickly. And so what happens is you have these IgE antibodies that go floating around in your blood. And as soon as they recognize for me tree nuts, they tell my white blood cells, specific ones, basophil and mast uh, cells, say, dump it all, buddy. So it'll dump everything I've got all at once, and I end up with anaphylaxis. And so that's type 1 hypersensitivity reaction, okay? Now, a, a type 2 cytotoxic uh, hypersensitivity reaction, this is cell-mediated, right? So what happens is you have uh, your body will end up attacking its own cells. Um, so... Um, I'm sorry, it's not cell, it's cytotoxic, sorry, cell mediated is uh, type 4. Um, what will happen is um, an antibody will bind to something and then complement is activated. And so we see this a lot in autoimmune diseases like uh, lupus is one. Um, I'm sorry, I've got these all mixed up in my head today, I'm sorry. Uh, you'll see this in hemolytic reactions. So um, when your body sees like, uh, have you ever heard of like someone getting the wrong blood and they have a transfusion reaction? You know, that's one way this can happen. Uh, RH hemolytic disease of the nu newborn is another one. Um, uh, auto autoimmune hemolytic anemia, it's very similar to the RH hemolytic disease. Uh, basically, what I want you to know, it's uh, your body will look for stuff, and when it finds that, it's marked with an anti uh, antibody complex, and your body will attack itself. Okay, that's the best way to do to explain that. There's a lot of videos on this um, to explain this, but I don't think this will be heavily tested at the EMT level. And then the immune complex uh, deposition. So we see this in, uh, again in lupus. And actually, I do think uh, lupus is a type 2 hypersensitivity reaction too as well. I think it's both. Um, but anyways, immune complex disease. So basically, you can have a bunch of antigens floating around in your blood, and they can get lodged in different areas. And um, we see this in rheumatoid arthritis, one. We also see this in uh, like arthritis reactions. We see this in serum sickness. But basically, these antigen antibody complexes will uh, circulate, and then they can activate complement. And that complement activation can sometimes not just attack that antigen antibody complex. It can also attack it, the body's own cells, and it can create an exaggerated response. Okay, and then lastly, cell mediated reaction. the The best example of this is poison ivy, poison oak, poison sumac, right? So basically, this takes a while. So if you've ever been exposed to poison ivy, you notice you don't immediately itch. It takes a couple days because it takes these T cells to react and to decide uh, that this is toxic or that they want to react, and then you end up with that reaction. We also see this in tuberculosis, um, certain fungal and parasitic infections. Uh, contact dermatitis is pretty much poison ivy, like I described. Um, so I'll tell you how I remember these is the mnemonic acid. So type one, a, right? This is acute, immediate. Okay. Allergic reactions, right? All of those involve a, right? So anaphylaxis is a type one type two cytotoxic. Uh, this is, um, cytotoxic. So you just remember the word C. Uh, this is when, again, like like blood disorder, like a RH disorder, you know, hemolytic disease of the newborn, stuff like that. Um, immune, and then I is immune complement, immune complex deposition. We had talked about that. And then D is uh, delayed or cell mediated hypersensitivity. Okay, so acid that might help you. Okay, I just talked about this. I'm, I don't think I want to spend. I will talk about this one, but I won't spend a lot of time on the other ones. Um, so again. When we have an antigen, this is a type 1 or an acute anaphylactic reaction, what happens is we'll have an antigen for me, it's tree nuts. It'll be floating around, and then you will see uh, the antigen enters my body through, through eating it. And my, plat uh, my IgE will recognize this pretty quickly, and it will say, oh, no, we have bound to this antigen, tree nuts, and we need to have this over-exaggerated response to it, and then it will release a bunch of cell mediators in the form of histamine from basophil and mast cells, and then that will cause widespread uh, inflammatory response, right? So leaky capillaries, vessel dilation, uh, it can cause an inflammation, it can cause edema of the, uh, uh, the, the alveoli, causes all of these issues, right? Mucus is, is produced, 
So it's this uh, exaggerated cellular response to something that's generally harmful. Like tree nuts really aren't harmful, but my body is convinced that they are. That's why it's a type 1 hypersensitivity reaction, okay? So we talked about immunodeficiency earlier. I'm not going to talk about that. Autoimmune reactions, we talked about that as well. So like lupus, myasthenia gravis, uh, multiple sclerosis. The autoimmune, auto is self, right? Immune. So it's self-immune reactions. So the the body is actually attacking itself. Uh, and this is fairly common, you know, Hashimoto's thyroiditis, right? Autoimmune. So like all these disorders, these are very pretty common. You will see these clinically in the field. I, I mean, there's factors that, it, that, that can cause disease. So genetic factors, environmental factors, age-related factors, sex-associated factors, right? Um, like male or female, you know? And even the act of having sex, right, can cause disease. STDs. So there's uncontrollable factors and controllable factors. So some things you can't control is like you don't ask to be born black or white. You don't get to pick your genetics out of the catalog. So you have no control over that. But we do have some control over whether the whether or not we smoke or drink or our nutrition or our physical exercise or our stress. And you might think to yourself, well, I don't have a lot of control over that. No, you really do. They are controllable. But the other word they'll use for this occasionally is modifiable factors, right? Because we can modify these. So modifiable factors, controllable factors are things that we can change. And so it kind of uh, depends on, on, on you if, if you're going to choose to control these or not. Okay. So uh, the analysis of disease risk, I, I mean, I, I don't want to read this to you. It's all studies of a disease should consider the incidence, prevalence, and mortality of the risk. So uh, I'll just explain to you what incidence is. Incidence is how often does this occur? The prevalence is how much is this in the community? And the mortality of the disease is how many people die from it. Okay, I'll say that again. Incidence is how often, I'll give you an example. Let's just talk about gonorrhea. Um, it's how often, or in a year span, how often are people getting gonorrhea on the college campus? How Prevalence would be how many people on the college campus have gonorrhea? Mortality of the disease, how many people on the college campus die from gonorrhea, right? That's incidence, prevalence, and mortality, okay? Um, don't have anything to add on that slide. So uh, common familiar risk factors in disease, okay? We've talked about this. Again, you have to be exposed to an antigen first, and then the plasma cells will produce antibodies. In this case, it's IgE. And then those IgE will bind to your white blood cells, or usually mast or basophils, uh, which are white a form of white blood cells. And then when you get exposed to an antigen, then your white blood cells will have the antibodies to react to the antigen. And then your white blood cells will release histamine and other chemical mediators to that response. Why am I telling you this? Because the very first time I ate tree nuts, I did not have an allergic reaction. It was the second time. That I ate tree nuts. So the reason this is tested is the very first time someone's ever stung by a bee, they don't have anaphylaxis. It's the second, third, fourth time. And each time that you're exposed to tree nuts or bees or what, the more antibodies are produced. And the more antibodies that are produced, the more be the, the more they're available to activate off of these mass or basophils. So mass cells or basophils. So that's why this is clinically relevant. This is called sensitization. So the more commonly you're the more often someone's exposed to their antigen, right? Right? So for me it's tree nuts or it might be ants for you or peanut butter or uh, you know, bees, the more extreme your immune response will get because each time you're being sensitized to the antigen. So this is an important theory. Okay? Now, cancer, you know, what's the other word for cancer? Neoplasia, okay? The tumor itself is called a neoplasm, okay? But cancer is, it's an abnormal growth of cells, okay? It's not rocket scientists or rocket science. Uh, so diabetes mellitus, it's one of the most significant endocrine diseases. I would agree with that. I'd say next to smoking is probably the worst things for your body. I mean, not that some people can help it, but I'm just letting you know, uncontrolled diabetes is particularly bad. So is smoking. Don't smoke if you're smoking. Um, so yeah, diabetes mellitus is a is a you know bad disease to have. Who knew? Uh, so hematological disorders. 
So um, I'm just going to walk you through this. So if you don't know, uh, let me start with the only way we can lose iron as a human is through bleeding. So for women, they lose iron through menstruation. For men, the only way we can lose iron is through bleeding. And then both men and female, uh, male and female, will lose just a very, very minuscule amount of iron through skin sloughing, through skin flakes. Okay. So our body very closely regulates how much iron we absorb. You could eat all the iron you want. Well, not really. You can eat iron, but your body will only absorb a certain amount of it. So we get iron through diets, right? Red meat, you know, meats. And so iron combines with a protein called alpha uh, apoferritin, and it binds in the duodenum, the first portion of the small intestine, to form ferritin. Well, iron is transported in the blood by ferritin, and it's carried to marrow uh, by transferrin, and it's used to make hemoglobin. We need iron to make blood, red, red blood cells, okay? And then hemoglobin is uh, broken down when blood blood cells wear out, and then it's recycled. So irons are cycled, so even when red blood cells die, as long as they're staying in the body, we're not losing them, uh, like outside of the body, like poop and blood or menstruation, um, then we reuse iron, okay? Now, iron that's not used, it's stored as a form called ferritin. So ferritin is the greatest indicator of iron stores. Um, so that's what that is, I'm explaining. But just know uh, we can get this thing called, he you know, hemolytic anemia. So this hemo blood lytic means to lyse. So we can get blood lysing anemia, right? So you could see this in a lot of different disorders, which I won't explain right now. You can see hemophilia. Hemophilia is when you lot, lack clotting uh, factors. This happens almost exclusively in men because it's an X, uh, X, uh, X-linked recessive disorder. So basically, uh, you will lack clotting disorders, or I'm sorry, clotting factors. And so this is very disorderly, and it's almost always in men. Okay, so, um, or boys, um, so what happens is this becomes relevant as a paramedic or ENT because, oh my God, the hemophiliac is now bleeding, has a nosebleed, right? Something like a nosebleed, and you're like, oh, that's not a big deal. Why'd they call 911? It's because they won't stop bleeding. They have to go to the hospital and get clotting factors injected into them. So it, we, we see this clinically. It's pretty rare, which, I mean, I know two people personally that have hemophilia, two men. Hemochromatosis, this is a weird disorder, but uh, you don't see it very often. Hemochromatosis is excess iron in the blood. It's from a genetic disorder. Okay, So it causes liver problems, bronze diabetes, gout, pseudogout. So anyways, um, cardiovascular disorders, cardiomyopathy. So this is an enlarged heart. We can end up with mitral valve prolapse. This is a valve disorder. Coronary heart disease. The coronaries are the vessels themselves that provide the muscle, the heart, oxygen, and blood. So when you have uh, the coronary arteries are clogged, right, that causes heart attacks. Hypertension, which is high blood pressure, stroke. You know, stroke is a cardiovascular disease. It's not a brain disease. It's really a vascular disease that affects the brain. Okay. This is weird that they show you. This is something called HOCM, hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy. So this is a normal heart. And this is the left ventricle right here. And blood should come out the left ventricle into the aorta. Well, what happens is in Hockham, right, hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy, the, 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 uh, the septum will become so thick, it can occlude the pathway for blood to go out of the heart into the aorta. So that creates an, uh, 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 an obstruction or a decreased outflow from the left ventricle, and this can this can actually be lethal. Um, but so this is a big deal when this happens. It doesn't happen very often though, but uh, it's a problem. So it's hyper. It's called HOCM. H O C M. Hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy. Myopathy. Myopathy. You know, you can get renal disorders like uh, gout, which really isn't, I mean, weird. It's not like a huge, re I mean, it is kind of, but it's more, you don't see it as a renal issue. You see it as like a joint issue. But kidney stones, uh, I'll have you know, this is unbelievably, uh, I mean, you wouldn't say it's unbelievable. It's rare for them to be this big. I want you to know that kidney stones are usually that big. They're usually really small. Um, you're not going to pee this out. This is called a staghorn calculus. So you would have to uh, have surgery to have that removed. Uh, and this is actually take this stuck. This is stuck in the kidney. Um, it's not in the ureter. Um, it's it's this is actually like a, a a cast of the the renal pelvis. So this is like actually in the kidney. I want you to know most kidney stones look like that though. I added that picture for y'all. GI disorders, right? 
So malabsorption disorders like um, pernicious anemia, stuff like that. Lactose intolerance, people that can't tolerate milk. Uh, ulcerative colitis. This is like ulcers, <laughs> ulcers within the anywhere in the or uh, it's uh, starting from the rectum up. Okay, ulcerative colitis. Um, Crohn's disease. Again, this is ulcers anywhere from the mouth to the anus. Peptic ulcer disease. So this is like ulcers within the stomach or the duodenum typically can cause bleeding, discomfort. Gallstones, we talked about this. Obesity, we've talked about that. Uh, neuromuscular disorders, Huntington disease, a genetic disorder. Uh, muscular dystrophy, uh, this almost explicitly affects men, again. Um, multiple sclerosis, this can affect men and women. Alzheimer's disease. You know, I don't want to explain all these to y'all right now. I, I probably should have even deleted these slides now that I'm saying them out loud. So let's just talk to stress, uh, our stress response um, and what this looks like. So stress can cause, it well does, cause a physiologic response. And I want you to know, stress isn't always like, oh my God, Hunter's talking too fast. I have so much EMT homework to do, right? That's one form of stress. But stress is also like, I'm stressed out because of financial situations, or I'm stressed out because of school, or my kids are stressing me out, or my spouse is stressing me out, or whatever, okay? Stress or acute stress. Someone is chasing me with a knife, you know, or whatever. There's acute stress. So stress isn't just like, I'm so stressed out. It's more than that, okay? So I want to be clear on that. And so stress has a lot of different ways that it can present. And physiologic stress is you know, change that, that makes it necessary for cells to adopt in the body. So physiologic, right? So the cells are physiologically adapting to stress. But they want you to know, and this is tested, there's the three-stage response. The first one is the alarm response. Oh, shit, someone's chasing me with a knife. Okay, alarm. Ah, we like beep, 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 alarm, right? And then we're either going to resist this stress of like, uh, beep, 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 I'm going to get stabbed and get killed, or I'm going to adapt. I'm going to get up and start running. And then if I run and I get short of breath, I will eventually become exhausted, right? So that's acute stress. Now let me give you um, um, uh, 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 a chronic stress, the alarm response. You log into Canvas for the first time, and you're like, oh, my God, I have a lot of homework, right? Beep, beep, beep. So you can resist that stress and not – do anything to it, or you can adapt and say, you know what, I'm going to make this work. But eventually, you can become exhausted by that response. So this is a chronic and an acute example of stress response, okay? Now, they're explaining what happens here, and I'll talk to you real quick about the pathophysiology of this. So up in the brain, we'll get some type of frontal lobe activation to say, you should be stressed out, Hunter. You should do something about this. And one of the quickest ways that we'll react is we'll get a nerve signal to the adrenal glands that'll say, dump the adrenaline, which is also known as epinephrine. And this will increase heart rate, breathing rate, and blood sugar. And why do we do this? It's to, to fight, right? So I need my heart rate up. I need my breathing rate up. I need my blood sugar up. All of these things to fight infection or to physically fight someone or whatever it is. But also, uh, and, and this comes from the adrenal medulla or med medulla. Okay, so th this has come from the adrenal glands. Remember the adrenal glands is a little pyramid-shaped object that sits on top of the kidneys. But another way that we respond to uh, stress is through adrenal corticotropic releasing hormone, uh, adrenal corticotropic hormone. Um, and this goes to the, again, the adrenals. But this time we're working in the cortex. And what happens is this will release glucocorticoids. And you've probably heard of the word. I want you to know this is called cortisol. And so cortisol is released from the adrenal cortex, and it tells your body, um, you should speed up your metabolism, you should not waste anything on anything we don't immediately need, like don't make a bunch of white blood cells right now because they take a lot of work, you know, we're going to raise the blood sugar, uh, we're going to try to increase your energy, you know, it's, it's steroids, right? So these are glucocorticoids, these are steroids, and if you wonder what the human analog of these is of cortisol that's going to be like dexamethasone prednisone methylprednisolone you know you've probably heard of these drugs if you've ever been prescribed a steroid uh hydrocortisone you know those are all trying to mimic this cortisol stuff that our body produces naturally in, in response to stress so why am i telling you this right if you have a prolonged response to stress you can end up with heart disease from an increased epinephrine dump you can end up with obesity Right, because you're, uh, you can end up with uh, high blood sugars. You can end up with 
all these issues that can release from too much cortisol and stuff. So I'm just letting you know, chronic stress has a really huge systemic effect on the body. When you're, when you're exposed to a large amount of stress for a long period of time, that's exceptionally bad. Okay. I just explained that. So this is the last side. I uh, appreciate y'all's attention. Basically, the effects of chronic stress um, is continued stress leads to loss of normal control mechanism. So if you're constantly stressed out, when you do get someone chasing you with a knife, you may not have the right response because you've exhausted those systems. You've exhausted your body. That's one way. And then we need to have coping mechanisms to, to, to help us respond to the physiological response of stress, okay? So I know, you know, if I'm stressed out, chronically, I might need to go to the gym, right? Or go shoot guns or whatever I like to do to try to cope with stress or watch a movie or relax or spend time with family, you know? And then with acute response, I know if I get real amped up, I may need to close my eyes and maybe think of a little jingle or song in my head, or I might need to do tactical breathing, right? T take a breath in for four seconds, hold it for four seconds, and breathe out for four seconds, right? That's tactical breathing. So there's different coping mechanisms we can use to respond to stress. And, uh, you know, in fact, you'll, you'll end up using these in your career for sure. And uh, I encourage you to find coping mechanisms that work for you to respond to your stress. So that's it for chapter eight. I appreciate y'all's attention and time. I know this is an intense chapter. Uh, again, we're going to hit some of these moving forward. If y'all have any questions, just reach out and uh, that's it.